Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest Steroplast Injury Rehab Network in partnership with Bazrat. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we've got a very interesting topic tonight, a little bit outside of the MSK sphere, sun, sunshine and skin cancer, tongue twister. Uh, and we welcome Dr. Barry Monk for this evening's talk. Just to get us underway, I'm going to do some housekeeping. So this is how we work everything on Zoom. If you want to introduce yourself, please do so in the chat box. We always love to see where we've got people attending from, what profession you're from, where in the world you are. So please pop into there and say hello. Uh, we're going to send certificates out to all of you joining us live this evening. Uh, we'll get those out to you tomorrow and you'll just be able to download them via a link. Uh, the presentation this evening will be about 30 to 40 minutes. And we will follow that up with a QA. and uh, If you do want to ask any questions, it's the circled uh, Q&A button that you can see there. Uh, please pop them in there rather than in the chat and also have a look at what's already been posted. Uh, somebody may have already asked the same question as you. If they have, you can just upvote it. And the more votes a question has, the higher up the list it will be and the more likely it is to get answered. In terms of the recording, uh, we will set, share that link with you all tomorrow when we send out the certificate link as well. So if you do want to check back on any parts of the presentation or the slides, etc., you can do so there. Um, like I said, we will send those out to you by email. Quick little bit of information about BASRAP. We're the professional association and the regulator for sport rehabilitators. And we've been running these webinars on a regular basis now since March 2020, uh, just providing CPD uh, to, uh, across various topics to all of you guys that are interested. If you do want to support our work, you can do so by becoming an associate member. The benefits are there, it's five pounds a month. And if you are interested in that, you can just pop me an email afterwards and I'll be happy to direct you to the right person. We do run these uh, events in partnership with Steroplast. And with that, I'll bring in Andrew, who will run through the rest of the introduction and bring in our guest speaker, Dr. Barry Monk. Thanks, Ollie. Um, evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on your uh, summer evening. Um, so just in terms of format, I, I'll do a quick um, introduction to who we are and the a bit of background to the Injury Rehab Network and some of the plans for events that we've got coming up. Um, as Ollie said, Barry will um, kindly do his, um, his presentation and I'll um, introduce Barry briefly shortly. And then Ollie's colleague, uh, Serena, is going to um, compare the, uh, the Q&A at the end. So um, as Ollie said, feel free to put your questions into the Q&A and uh, carry on. I know I've seen a few people introducing yourselves in, in the chat. So um, Seraplus Healthcare are a, um, a medical company um, based in Manchester and it's essentially sort of consumables. Um, first aid and medical items for, for sports injuries and we're really pleased to be working in partnership with a range of sports teams, governing bodies, educational organisations and um, sports rehabilitators and we, we've been really um, glad to be able to work in partnership with um, Bazrat for the, uh, the injury, injury Rehab Network events. Uh, if you could just move on please Ali. Uh, so the Injury Rehab Network started in 2019 and we were initially running face-to-face -face events which came about because a lot of the partners we work with um, they didn't really have a forum to collaborate, um, to get CPD and to share ideas with, with other people, particularly in the Northwest where, where we're based. Um, so we, um, we've we continued to develop that. And with lockdown, we've been really pleased to take the events online um, with the support of Bazrat. And um, we've had a, a great series of guest speakers this year, um, really well attended with some brilliant engagement. So thanks to everyone who's um, supported the, these events and obviously to all of our guest speakers who, who've given up the time. Um, so our next event after this one is our first uh, return to a face-to-face a -face event. And actually the first time that we're going to attempt to run a hybrid uh, in-person and online event. So, uh, it's a date for your diary of the 20th of September, um, 5 p.m. till 8 p.m. at University Academy 92 in Manchester, next to um, Old Trafford Cricket Ground. And the, the, the guest presenter is Dr. Ian Horsley, who's currently just returned from Tokyo, where he was one of the lead medical team uh, supporting the, the, the team there. Uh, there'll also be presentations from some of our partners about new and innovative products 
interest in um, sports rehabilitation. Um, so um, we'll hopefully in the next week or so have some registration details available to share. But for now, um, please get that date in, in the diary. Uh, following on from that in October, we've got Intiaz Ahmad from QPR. And in the autumn, we're just working to confirm some dates with uh, presentations from Beverly at the British American Football um, Association and also with one of the boxers that we work with, Hannah Rankin, uh, and her coach and her, um, her team doctor. Um, so, yeah, that's the plans. Um, as always, any ideas, feel free to send them through to Ollie, Serena um, or myself. And uh, any feedback is always um, much appreciated as well. But, um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll let um, Dr. Barry Monk um, introduce himself. But, uh, again, uh, another outstanding guest speaker. And thanks, Barry, for, for, for giving up your time. Uh, another expert with decades of uh, experience in, in your field and very, very passionate about what you do in a I, I know that um, what people will learn tonight can help them and to raise the awareness of skin cancer and can hopefully um, add a string to their bow in terms of uh, being able to identify some of the, uh, the signs and potential problems early. So yeah, thanks very much and I hope um, everyone finds it useful. Right, so now the nerve wracking moment, I'm going to screen share. Yeah. <laughs> then I go onto this thing and then... Um, it's going to work. Is this going to work? Hang it's on. It's going to work. Slide show from the beginning. Does that happen? Hang on. No, it hasn't. No, hang on. From the slide show. Did you do the share on Zoom, Barry? Sorry? Did you do the share button on Zoom? Have I done it? I should think I have. have I, no, have I not done that? No. If you do share on Zoom. All oh, right. Good. Hang on. Let's go into... Sorry about this, I copped up the entire thing already. Oh, is that showing up now? No. Not yet. So green green share button on Zoom. Hang on, I've got to escape from the presentation. I'm sorry, I've copied up the entire performance. So I can see you in the corner, but I can't get onto. So if you come out of your presentation. What do I do with that one now? Oh, hang on. I'm on. I'm on Zoom now. Right. No, hang on. I've lost. Am I still on your meeting? Because I can't get onto the Zoom. Yeah, still on. So if you if you click back into Zoom, I might have to join you again. Hang on. Where have I gone? What did I do wrong there? I can see you on Zoom. I can see your picture here. Have you got the green button at the bottom, Barry? No, I'm, I, I've got... What have I got wrong here? Zoom. Um, As a backup, I can always share the slides for you if you want. I've got a copy. Yeah, shall we do that uh, uh, rather than waste, wasting more time? Yeah, give me a second. I'm just going to bring them up. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what we've done wrong. I don't know what I've done wrong here. I can see you in the corner. It's always different live. Oh, hang on. I've done it. Hang on. Screen share. Go to screen share. You're now screen sharing. And yeah. That's good. So if you go to your present... There we go. So click back into PowerPoint. Hit slideshow. Hang on. I'm just going to move this down the thing. Bottom slideshow. Can you see me now? Yeah. Right. Perfect. We're there. Yes. Are we there? We're there. Yep. Great stuff. And, and you can hear me. Right. Good evening. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm completely useless at technology, but uh, let's see how things go. I'm very sorry to be talking about something that's outside your normal field. But I'm also very honoured that you've, uh, you've asked me. Um, I've been a dermatologist for longer than I can uh, care to remember. Um, used to have a mixture of NHS, but now purely in private practice, having just retired from the NHS, finally, they've got rid of me last year. Um, I have got no conflicts of interest that are relevant to this. All the opinions are my own. Now, I do have mentioned, and there are pictures of uh, people in the public domain, but none of those are my patients, so I'm not and all the clinical information about them is just, uh, can be culled from the internet. So it's nothing is, per there's no personal information. 
so if you want to quote what I've said, that's perfectly okay. I feel a little bit daunted talking to all these sports professionals who no doubt do all sorts of involved in all sorts of important cricket uh, sports teams. Uh, but I must say, I was very proud that two years ago I did uh, appear in a match against the MCC. Um, but in fact, what you don't know is that the MCC uh, run a, a, a chess team, and even at that, they beat us five nil. So that's my sporting uh, contribution. I'm going to talk about skin cancer, and it's an interesting subject for various reasons, but it is, amongst those reasons, it's common and it's increasing, and it occurs in younger people, and there have been a lot of high-profile cases in sports people, and additionally, for reasons we'll talk about, uh, many sports people may be particularly susceptible, particularly vulnerable. So that's a good reason. And um, you sports rehabilitators have an important role potentially in prevention and in health education. And uh, as we'll talk about, early diagnosis can be life-saving. And you may just have the opportunity, as others in your profession have, of spotting something. You may not know what it is, but you know enough to know that this is something that perhaps someone should have a little look at. So there are a whole host of reasons why this might be relevant to, to you. Um, the chap on the right here is, um, or rather was, um, a very renowned footballer in Scotland, Tommy Burns, played a captain of Celtic, captain of Scotland, um, who died aged 51 of malignant melanoma. The chap on the right actually by chance is also Scottish, uh, called Darren Moore. And he was diagnosed at a very young age, in his early 20s, when he was just embarking on his professional career with melanoma. And he was successfully treated after a lot of surgery, but in fact decided at that stage to, uh, to uh, give up his professional career. So it's an important diagnosis, and it happens to real people, and it happens to young people. You'll also notice, uh, and it's not a fluke, that both of these people have a very typical Scottish complexion. Uh, ginger hair and freckles, and the sort of person who goes bright red with the slightest uh, hint of, uh, of sunlight. And we'll come. This is Paul Merson, Arsenal, a former Arsenal footballer, commentator, and he's also had a melanoma, fortunately uh, uh, successfully treated. So these things are common. There have been a lot of high profile cases. And this is uh, Andy Flower. Uh, formerly the uh, England coach, but before that um, played test cricket for Zimbabwe and at one stage was the world number one uh, cricketer. And again, another fair haired, auburn haired, uh, auburn person. And uh, he had a melanoma successfully, early one successfully treated. And these high profile cases can uh, often have a positive role in health education, public education as they have in a whole range of other uh, medical issues occurring in sports people. In the Olympics, we've started talking for the first time uh, about stress in, um, and, and mental health amongst sports people, another important, really important thing. And there have been other areas, Doddy Weir and his campaign about motor neurone disease and so on. And in addition, sports doctors and physios and health rehabilitators, team doctors, do have some sort of element of duty of care. And we'll talk about this in those sports people who have really high risk and whose sports put them at particular risk. Now, Andy Flower's case is one of those really embarrassing ones because he was the England coach on an Ashes tour to Australia a few years ago. And he was noted to have a melanoma which is the most serious type of skin cancer on his face, was spotted by one of the Australian physios during the Ashes series. And uh, Andy was whisked off to see a dermatologist, underwent some surgery, has been perfectly well otherwise. But how embarrassing is that? And how embarrassing would that be for you if you had a situation where, uh, you know, for the poor old England team doctor and the team physio who've been seeing Andy every day of the year for months or years on end, not spotting anything. And one of your positions say, hey, mate, what's that thing? 
Uh, I don't think that's good um, PR for them, really. They must feel awful about it. And opportunist spotting of melanoma is important. Dustin Johnson, uh, leading uh, American golfer, um, he had a malignant melanoma on his leg. Fortunately, an early one successfully treated, but it was spotted by an orthopedic surgeon. Um, he was having some knee problems. He'd been to see an, a, a knee specialist. And in the course of the examination, he said to him, uh, by the way, um, there's a, a little place on your leg and I think we're going to ask a dermatologist. So these cases do get picked up by sports professionals, uh, sports rehabilitation and sports medicine professionals. And it's really important that they do. So you've got a great opportunity. You're examining someone's shoulder or their back or their thigh possibly areas of their anatomy they don't normally pay too much attention to. It's a great opportunity to uh, just say, well, while you're here, I'll sort out your shoulder, but there's just a little something I'm not quite 100% sure about. There are three main types of skin cancer. Malignant melanoma is the most important because this is the thing that kills people and it kills people when they're young if it's not treated. But the wonderful thing about melanoma is that for early melanomas, if you spot them when they're early, treatment's incredibly successful. So that's why we bang on and on and on about uh, checking moles and such like. Basal cell carcinoma is um, very common, tends to occur in an older age group, but not exclusively, and presents with little non-healing lesions. We'll talk about these. They grow very slowly. They don't spread internally. They don't kill people. And squamous cell carcinoma is a more aggressive type of cancer, um, but not quite as common. And again, tends to occur in older people. But in all three of these, sunshine, ultraviolet light, not, uh, ultraviolet light exposure is thought to play a really big part in the causation. Now, to concentrating on melanoma, it can occur at any site on the skin and at any age. Um, rare in children, but certainly in uh, from the twenties onwards, you must think about if you see a funny mole, a thing that doesn't quite look right. It typically occurs in fair skin cut subjects. If you're dark skin, if you're uh, Afro Caribbean, Black, uh, Asian skin, it's pretty uncommon, not absolutely uh, unknown. But I showed you examples of red hairs, heads, and I'll show you more of those. These are the people most likely. And it's related, we think, to past episodes of sunburn. That's the factor. It's not the accumulation of, of ultraviolet. It's episodes of burning with sun. And it's going up and up and up. More in men than in women, but, but essentially in both. And you can see from these figures over the course of uh, 25 years in this graph, it's more than doubled. So it is probably the most, the most rapidly growing type of cancer. And there are about um, 5,000 melanoma deaths in the UK a year. So it's, it's, it's not a rarity. What do you think about when you see a melanoma? Well, there, these are pictures and they're fairly typical examples not very subtle, but you could, you could, if you looked at a mole, and if I suppose that was a centimetre in diameter, you'd immediately say, that looks a bit peculiar. I'll show you more, more pictures. The more you see, the more peculiar they look. And um, we think of an A, B, C, D. Um, asymmetry, I'll go back to the previous slide in a second, but the border irregularity, the colour, in other words, variation in colour. And we talk about the diameter, but actually we've changed the D now. We just say D for different. It just, they just look different from ordinary moles that everyone has. So when I say asymmetry, it's uh, different in different places. The border, there's these indentations, um, colour, there's lots of different colours. There's brown and there's black and there's red, uh, sometimes even little patches of white. Um, and D, they just look different. Sometimes in dermatology we talk about 
the ugly duckling. Okay, she's got lots of moles, but there's just one of them that just looks different. Now, I'm not expecting you to be confident about diagnosing melanomas, but just some ones that are slightly more subtle. The previous ones are pretty barn door, but a mole that just doesn't look like an ordinary mole. Some of it's black, some of it's brown, some of it's uh, violet in colour and funny shapes and uh, odd patterns to it. Some of it flat, some of it lumpy. And this would, these, any of these would be things that you just say, I'm not quite sure what that is. Let, let's just have, get you have a quick look at, uh, with someone who's seen these things before. I'm not asking you to diagnose them. I'm just asking you to think, just to think about them when you see funny moles on your skin. And again, more just funny shapes, funny, uh, funny sizes, different colors. Just the ugly duckling, the one that stands out as being different. So when to ask for help, a mole that's changed, always worth thinking about. It may have a perfectly innocent change. It may have just been chafed on clothing or, um, or on kit or something or scraped. And, uh, but a mole that looks different, the ugly duck, duckling. And if you're in, if in doubt, ask. A dermatologist will never ever say, oh my goodness, how could you have sent such a trivial nonsense to me? We'd much rather see something say, I understand why you referred it, but actually this is fine. We'd much rather do that. But if it's not diagnosed early, there will be secondary spread to lymphatics and widespread metastatic disease. Whereas early malignant melanoma has a good prognosis, a good chance of cure. So who gets malignant melanoma? Fair skinned people, not just redheads, but blonde uh, people. Skin which burns easily, uh, where there's a history of sunburn and a family history may not be genetics. It may be just that the whole family are all fair or they all used to go and spend all their holidays on the beach or playing cricket or to or doing whatever. And when I've talked about ultraviolet light, it's the only sort of bit of serious science I'll have in this talk. The visible spectrum of light goes from red uh, to blue and the wavelength increases as you go towards the red. Um, so this is the sort of spectrum and beyond this is what we call ultraviolet light, the bit we can't, uh, we can't see. And the, that, the, the bits that are dangerous are just beyond the visible spectrum. Now, ultraviolet light comes from the sun essentially. As it travels through the atmosphere, it is to some extent absorbed. And the longer it goes through the atmosphere, the, the shorter wavelengths are absorbed more. So that in the evening, when the sun is low, light has traveled further through because it's going at an angle. And all the blue end of the spectrum has been absorbed, which is why the sun in the evening looks red. But these, this, the, on the other hand, um, the shorter wavelengths reflect more. So that if you're on snow or on water, the ultraviolet will be much more intense because it'll be, um, uh, you'll get the reflected ultraviolet as well as the uh, direct hits. And if you're high up in the atmosphere, if you're on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, there'll be much less absorption because it'll have traveled through much a shorter distance through the atmosphere. So if you want to really get burned, you stand on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro when there's snow, reflection off the snow, and uh, you're at 16,000 feet. That's the place to get really seriously sunburned quickly. So that's what we're talking about there. That's any little bit of science we talk about. So when is the ultraviolet most intense? When the sun is highest. And this is important because in the evening, when the sun's red or early morning, it may be very warm, it may be very bright, full day, uh, uh, fully um, daytime, but there'll be very little ultraviolet light. At altitude, so if you've got anyone between altitude training, as a lot of um, athletes, distance athletes do, um, that can be a question. Or on snow or water, skiers or sailors can get really badly burned easily. 
So who's the greatest risk? Well, going back to Andy Flower, he was born in Central Africa. So there's the ultraviolet light is strongest the nearer you are to the equator. He, at cricketers these days are doing sport all the year round. They play over here in the summer, then in the winter they go to South Africa, or Australia, uh, or, or these days to the Middle East. He was red haired, fair skinned. He never played with a cap. And he was a wicketkeeper and opening batsman. So he was on the pitch for the whole match. And when he wasn't playing cricket, he was a very keen golfer. And um, so he was outdoors all the time. So the chances of someone like that getting a skin cancer are almost 100%. Um, and melanoma has hit a lot of them, a lot of uh, cricketers. Richie Benno, former Australian captain, he died of melanoma. Max Walker, another great test player, he died of melanoma. And um, Matthew Hoggard and Ryan Sidebottom, who are former test players over here, have had melanoma successfully treated. So it, you need to, these are real people. And uh, some of the, of, of the cricketers who've been involved um, have um, done a lot towards health education. High risk sports, things that are outside. There's not much risk, particular risk, if you're a snooker player or if you play darts. But water sports and skiing are the really serious risk. If you're on water, there'll be the reflected ultraviolet light and the direct. All the year round sports, cricket these days, all the year round, golf, they're playing in sunny places all the year round, sports with altitude training and uh, sports where you do lots of training during the daytime outside. Now the English, the ECB uh, over here and uh, golf in America have both been taken skin cancer very seriously, particularly in the States prompted by Dustin Johnson. Um, and all county cricketers now are offered an annual um, skin check but I was watching uh, television last year when England were playing a test series in India. And of course, they got two redheads in the team. And I was watching on one particular day and both these chaps had the most terrible sunburn. So they may do the skin checks, but someone isn't necessarily um, giving them the best advice that they were both absolutely bright red arms and faces and it wasn't just the exertion or the heat, it, they were definitely burned. So what's your role? Well, various, there's the opportunist examination. You've got the patient undressed, you're having a look at them. Just if you spot something that's different, don't say, well, I'm only here to deal with their shoulder. Um, mention it, it's important. Um, some sports have taken on screening and that's obviously very good and, it, and the greatest opportunity to, uh, to involve, to start screening is when there's been a high profile case in uh, a particular uh, sport that you're involved with and if everyone wants to get on the bandwagon, it's a great uh, opportunity. And health education, I know that it's Sportsmen have got so much to take in and they want to give everything uh, you know, right and they're concentrating on the here and now. But there is an opportunity to um, say to, to players and to um, team doctors, this is an opportunity to tell people about looking after their skin. It is, it is important and, it's, it's, and uh, I think it's important to think about this. There are various aspects, obviously, um, for an elite athlete in any sport, um, winning takes priority. But there are little interventions which don't interfere. Um, you can think about clothing. I notice most of uh, these days, all the rowers at least wear caps. It's not perfect, but they're going to be out all the time. And at least it stops the sun uh, hitting the, top, the tops of their heads and, and gives them some, at least some element of protection. You could think about Timing of training um, could train uh, the outdoor training. If you're going to be in a sport where you do a lot of time, could at least some of it be done early morning, early uh, or evening, and date uh, the, in the middle of the day, 
uh, some of the indoor work being done. Can shade be provided during rest periods if they're doing some sort of interval training? Um, can there be areas of shade on the training grounds? And of course, very, very importantly, sunscreens. Uh, using And of course, you have to choose one that uh, is, a, is water resistant, has to be UVA and UVB and with a high protection factor and regular and proper application, really important. These things do work, but only if you use them. There's one that I, that I, I like. I'm, I have no uh, financial connection with this, but it's a product a lot of dermatologists recommend um, because it's, um, it's not sticky, it's not greasy, it's not messy. And they do provide um, a one litre size pump action um, uh, supply of this, which is designed specifically for sports clubs, sports teams. So you can just have this in the dressing room or the changing room. So everyone, before they go out, has a squirt. And if you want to use one of these things, you have to put it on as in, in the right, uh, the picture on the right hand side of the, of the screen, nice and thickly. One, one tiny little smear will not cover the whole of your skin, but treat the vulnerable and the exposed areas. Um, back of the neck, ears, face, the arms or shoulders are exposed depending on what sport it is just think about uh, uh, that um so it's a product i i, I recommend to people and, and uh, so they've got this one liter um at, uh, supply which you can have which is quite useful talk about the other cancers they tend to occur in older people but this is so-called basal cell carcinoma and it just presents with just a little spot that just doesn't seem to be healing rather inconsequential but again, uh, and then it, it develops this sort of more ulcerated area, which if it's not treated can become quite large as in, in the, uh, on the um, right hand side picture. I was just reading this evening, Phil Tufnell has been treated for a basal cell carcinoma and about, I would reckon about 50% of um, Australian former test cricketers have had this. So it's very important to uh, spot, very easy to treat if it's recognized early but they, it may involve complex surgery if, if it's neglected. Squamous cell carcinoma is a bit in between. They're less common, but they grow much more. You, you wouldn't miss one of these. They, they grow very rapidly, usually in uh, older people. And one special group, well, they're special for all sorts of reasons, but um, patients who are immunosuppressed who are taking long-term immunosuppressive drugs, uh, which more and more people do because they've had more and more transplants um, are being done and, and transplant people survive and they thrive. But these patients have an enormously increased risk of skin cancers. And um, it's one of the things they will have been told about, whether they're sports people or not, every transplant patient because of the drugs they have to take is told about being careful with the skin. But um, if you've had a transplant and you've got your life together again, you're doing elite sport, uh, they have an enormously increased risk of skin cancer. So if any of you are involved in these wonderful activities, you know, transplant games and all these other sorts of things, um, if you've got anyone under your care who um, is, a, uh, is a transplant survivor, then do just be even more vigilant, even more on the lookout than, than you would normally be. So that's quite important. So if anyone wants to get in contact with me, that's my email address. You're very welcome to drop me a line. Um, I hope you've enjoyed, enjoyed the talk and I hope we've got some questions coming up. And just finally, I have just written a book. It's a paperback, it's available on, on Amazon or all the other online resources. Um, it's about, um, it's interesting stories about the NHS, about what happens when things go wrong and some of the strange and weird things. It's a good read. As you see on the blurb on the left hand side, fake doctors, forge wills and disappearing postmortems. There's a lot to read. It's, a, it's very interesting. It'll put the shivers down your spine. But at this, that point, I'm going to end and pass back to, I think it's Serena who's going to organise the questions. Yep, we've got quite a few questions for you, Barry. Someone's just, asked... Stop share. Should I press the stop share? If you can just wait a second, someone's just Sorry. asked if you can pop your email address back on 
that's oh, okay, sorry, right? that. oh, God, what have I done? Okay. Um, you just I go think... back to the previous slide. One before. Yeah. I hope it's with offer for free there tickets for Manchester United or something. <laughs> <laughs> Other teams may be available. <laughs> Right, so we'll start off, Barry, with the first question. So Anthony's asked, is factor 50 too high? Some exposure needed to gain vitamin D. Um, you can, vitamin D is important, but actually pretty minimal sun exposure will um, give you vitamin D and a sports person on a decent diet will not be deficient in it. Factor 50, how these numbers are calculated is, is a science in itself. And, um, but anything less than factor 50 is probably not going to give you serious sun protection of a type, which is important if you've got a fair skinned or freckly um, athlete under your care, who's doing an active, you know, going to be outside four hours a day or more, as they may well be in, um, if they're a rower or if they're a, a, lot, a distance runner. And what about those people who, who might not be outside frequently but you know they have a normal normal job they're working inside a clinic potentially do you think would you still recommend wearing back 50 on the face i i would de definitely yes and in even in the, i'm 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 not a, amazingly fair skinned but i'm quiet and even on in say march in this country if you've got a bright day and it can be pretty chilly but you're out in the middle of the day um for a couple of hours doing your garden or walking your dog you can get you can definitely go red, you can definitely be burned uh, in this country any time from about March to October. Mm -hmm. The depth of winter in this country, you probably won't. Um, and of course, sudden sun exposure, intense sun exposure. I think melanoma is more in, uh, common in places like uh, in Scotland than in the rest of the UK, probably because people are desperate for a bit of sunshine. So they go off on their two weeks to um, uh, to the Mediterranean and, and get absolutely scorched and their skin isn't designed for it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And what about getting burnt through glass? Some, someone called Wendy's asked. Um, I presume that's ultra, still... uh, a Normal window glass should uh, stop ultraviolet light. So um, we always say in dermatology, there are one or two rare conditions where you have what's abnormal photosensitivity, abnormal sensitivity to light. And we normally say if anyone actually gets burned through uh, window glass, there's some underlying cause for it. It's not just you're just fair skinned. Uh, if, you, if you're indoors all the time, and you, unless there's a medical reason for it, um, for, and the things that make, can make you photosensitive, certain drugs, certain uncommon uh, conditions such as lupus can make you mm. abnormally sensitive to light. So anyone who's, who burns through window glass, uh, that needs to be looked into. That's uh, unusual and needs to be looked into. Okay, someone else has asked, we read about various sunscreens being carcinogenic. Any comments on that, Barry? Do you know of any I've sunscreens? Not, oh, yes, I've not heard, I've on, genuinely not heard of that. I think what is carcinogenic is not, is not wearing a sunscreen if, if you're fair as That's more damaging. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Bob has said this is more of a statement than a question. So the yeah. England cricket dressing room is awash with sun cream right up to fact 90, yeah. which is like putting on polyfiller. But how do you get players to wear it, especially some of the strong characters who've, who've been mentioned this evening? Uh, there you are. Um, I think that should be... How do we get people to change behaviours in anything? Uh, Goodness only knows. I mean, but 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 behaviours do ch do change. I remember when days when uh, um, you saw footballers running onto the pitch, stubbing out a cigarette as they uh, as they uh, ran on. And I'm talking about you know <laughs> what, what in those days was called the first division. And I'm, I'm so old, I still remember that. But then you know that sort of thing uh, used to be remembered. You know, sports people mm. used to advertise cigarettes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Used to uh, thing, things gradually change. Sometimes the only thing that changes it is, is when there's been um, um, a, a disaster or a catastrophe. Yeah. And, uh, I, I know it's very difficult to, to pick, you know, concentrate on the, on the now. The last thing that they want, a sports, elite sports person, 
wants to be told is, is you know, and by the way, be careful about the sun. And of course, these yeah. days, sports people have got, have got, are awash with information. I, I know some of the, uh, when it's, one of our local counties when I know some of the players and they in off season they get lectures about gambling awareness and media training and what not to put on Twitter and you know their life is at a nutrition and goodness only knows what and their their poor little brains are awash with information and yeah. I think you've just got to make it a, a ritual within the dressing room it's all about the education side isn't it and I think like education it's a bit like nagging children it doesn't actually work so if you've got someone who's being a bit difficult you just got to think laterally in some way or other yeah exactly um okay another question barry so when selecting sun cream for protection what's more important the spf value or the level of uv protection or are they the same thing well uh, it's um the spf only actually measures the block the degree to which it blocks um um UVB, the long, uh, the um, which is the, the longer wavelength, no, the shorter wavelength of ultraviolet, right? Uh, and it doesn't, uh, but um, basically, um, the most important thing is what people will wear. Some people don't like some. If you gave people five um, sun creams and said try them all out, they'll be they'll choose different ones in terms. Of, I don't like this one smells or it feels slightly sticky or against the skin. Um, mm. I've mentioned I've got no shares and there aren't shares available. It's a private company, Altruist, um, but I quite like it because I use it myself. It, it's not sticky. You haven't got an aroma to it, and it works. Uh, and it's available in, in a in a nice big size that makes it easy to use. A nice big hundred gram tube, and it's yep. cheap, which means there's no excuse saying, "Oh my God, I'm not going to pay twenty five pounds for a, a thirty gram tube that lasts <laughs> a day." Uh, yeah. It's about four pounds for a for a hundred gram tube, and proportionately for it for the for the uh, one liter size. So um, it's what you you use. But no doubt, there's some people who say, "Well, I don't particularly like that one." And there are yeah. occasional people who are allergic to some of the ingredients in mm -hmm. different sunscreens. And if you've got someone who's fair who wants to use a sunscreen, but the main thing is to get them to use one. They don't feel it's sticky on their skin because they don't want to, you don't want to say. Oops excuse them oh i missed that catch because i was itching my skin you know yeah yeah there's another good sun cream <laughs> you're dealing with um, a group of people where um what's in the moment takes priority over it if anything else we yeah. all know that you're dealing yeah, with a very abnormal sorry abnormal the wrong word, atypical group of, of human beings yeah and i'm sure that those of you that thrive in your particular profession learn how to persuade people to do what they don't instinctively want to do yeah absolutely rest, resting and joint the last thing they want to hear don't you know uh, i'm sure this happens all the time but i'm sure that those of you that get good at uh, dealing with elite sports people just know how to to manage them yeah absolutely emma's asked um barry how quickly can there be a change to a model could it change very quickly or would it be more over a long period of time I think if, that it's very difficult to, to, to learn, but I think sometimes people say this has definitely changed in the last month. Mm. And of course, how, how carefully do you look over your skin? I say to patients, well, twice, I'm not talking about people who are at high risk, but I just say to them, well, once or twice a year, take all your clothes off and examine your skin from top to toe and get someone to look at the bits you can't see. And yeah. uh, is there anything that anyone says, oh, my God, I don't like that, or alternatively, I don't remember that being there last time? Yeah. And that's, and, and that's an indication for seeing someone. And, and, you know, for a dermatologist, it doesn't take you five minutes to say, yes, that's something, or no, that isn't. Yeah. And someone said, are there any other symptoms other than the appearance of a mole or an unusual-looking uh, mole that you... It's something that anyone would take notice of, but I don't think anyone would ignore bleeding. Itching is, yep. very, uh, is not a, a specific symptom, but totally benign moles itch and melanomas may or may not itch. So that, that's one that doesn't, just because something's itching, it, that's not something to It's not an indicator. So it's mainly just looking at those unusual moles. Does it look up? different from your, all, everyone's got moles. Does it look different from, from uh, the others? Um, yeah. As a rule of thumb, if it's more less than about five or six millimeters in diameter, it's pretty unlikely to be anything yeah. nasty, but not absolutely guaranteed. 
And someone has asked the risk of skin cancer with your medications like your thiazides and voriconazole. So I presume uh, they're the ones that make you... The only drugs that really have an influence on, um, uh, on, on risk are immunosuppressive treatments. Um, and there's an awful lot of... These days, it's, it's everyone who's had a transplant and quite a lot of people who are on who've got various rheumatological conditions, some people who are on um, long-term treatments for severe psoriasis uh, and certain inflammatory bowel diseases. So there's more and more pe people in the general population. And mm -hmm. for some of those people, they, it wouldn't be impossible for, for them to be elite athlete, uh, sports people. Yeah. Okay. And someone has asked, which is quite a good question, what is the shelf life of sun creams, sunscreens? I know they normally have them on the bottom, don't they? 12 months or if you're using them regularly you shouldn't have any that are out of date <laughs> <laughs> yeah they've gone out of date then go, then you're not using it frequently enough so would you say you can just use that number as soon as you open it you've normally got that number on it don't you 12 yeah, months I, or six I, months I, I, i'm not one of these people who's obsessed with, with, with <laughs> shelf lives i'm afraid uh, if you looked in my fridge you'd have a terrible shock <laughs> um, <laughs> let alone my medicine cabinet but it, it, you're quite right but i think that if you know if you are someone who is training um, several times a week outdoors or play or playing as golfers would be every day and yep. putting on a sunscreen in a decent quantity uh, I, uh, every day. I don't think that you will, um, uh, you'll worry about the thing running out of date. And I'll just on, on as an aside, um, and don't forget their caddies and the team physios and the, and the uh, sports prof uh, rehabilitation professionals who might also be spending hours and hours um, on the, uh, uh, you know, outside with them, umpires and referees, linesmen, mm -hmm. line judges at tennis. I think we've got time for a few more questions, don't we, Ollie? Or are we running yeah, out? Yeah, sneak them in. We've got, I, there's one I just I didn't want to get missed because there's a really good one in the chat from Mir Ibrahim that's it, not gone in the Q and A, but I'm gonna I'm gonna slide it in because it's a great question. Um, you mentioned screening, Barry. Is there a particular screening questionnaire or set of questions that you'd recommend if you are doing routine screening for skin cancer? I, I would. My method of of, of I have I don't specifically do screening clinics, but I just. Um, Plenty of patients come along saying they just like a check over, and often it's prompted by the fact that, that the next door neighbour or friend or someone has uh, had a skin cancer. And I just get them undressed and I examine them carefully in a good light from head to toe. Um, and it takes you five minutes, and uh, anything that's suspicious gets carefully examined with uh, a dermatoscope, which is a sort of polarised illuminating light. And um, I don't think we missed anything terribly much. It's, it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. Um, but I think for uh, if you're screening um, as a club, I think that, you know, you could get the whole team looked at in, in an hour or an hour and a half, just have them walk through one at a time and through the uh, in and out. They're all used to taking their kit off. Um, and... Uh, and then give them an information leaflet and a free tube of sunscreen and tell them to get on with it. <laughs> that would be my method, really. Good stuff. I'll stop putting in now, Serena. Sorry. That's all right. I think we'll ask a few more questions, Barry, and then we can wrap up. I, I'm not, I hope I'm not boring people. Well, not too many people are clicking off. I've got this list of participants. They're not all disappearing, which is always a good sign. Exactly. No, we've still got quite a few questions in here. So... Holly said, I have unfortunately had a diagnosis of malignant melanoma in my own past medical history. I found it devastating. Thankfully caught early and fine, but could you comment on support services, post-diagnosis and the role of sporting medical team within that? Well, I think that, um, I'm, 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 well, I'm pleased to hear that your one has been sorted out. It's a terrible shock to people. You know, and especially, uh, you know, you're, you're, it occurs in, in people who are young and fit and, and, and such like. Um, early melanoma is very treatable. That's, that's the important thing to say. And I think that the best advocates for screening and for encouraging people to check themselves and to use sunscreens are uh, patients. And um, I, I regularly see patients 
um, sent along saying, my, my friend has told me to get checked out because my friend's just had a melanoma. Um, and um, it's a bit like cardiac screening in um, footballers. You know, I'm sure that following the uh, Christian Eriksen story and the others that there have been, um, the players themselves will just be queuing up saying, please, can we have this? I don't think that there's any, there will be any difficulty. And yeah. I think you can use this in a, pos a, a, a positive way. Um, and I think, uh, was it in Holly who asked the question? Yes, it yeah. was Holly. Well, I'm sure that Holly will you know, be a terrific advocate for being able to show people that don't be reckless about the sun because I know what it's like and it's not nice. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are better and better support services that, these days. Nowadays, every hospital dermatology department or plastic surgery uh, department in the NHS will have a specialist nurse who can talk to you whenever you, you need to and uh, they're all uh, trained by Macmillan and all that sort of thing. So following from that, Barry, someone has asked if you do find a mole that you think is cancerous, what's the next step? So would that just be go to your GP? Go to your GP and there is uh, a fast, if the GP looks at it and if it meets certain criteria, which are more or less the uh, the things that I uh, outlined of size and shape and such like, uh, there is a fast track service as there is for all ca uh, suspected cancers called mm -hmm. the two week rule. In other words, you're supposed to be seen by a specialist within two weeks. Um, now, if it turns out to be a melanoma, the system works pretty well. If it turns out to be something uh, just as an oddity or, or benign or harmless, then you'll be sent, you know, discharged. I think these days the NHS we try to avoid removing things just for the sake of it. So, yeah. But you won't get away with getting cosmetic treatment of a mould you just particularly don't like. No. Um, but uh, we, I, I think it's you hear stories about the NHS these days, but the system most most of the time and in most places is working. It might it may be uh, uh, creaking a little bit, but for skin cancers it does work. In two weeks seems fairly fairly quick as well. That's fab. Okay, I think we'll wrap up there, Barry. So very we'll much. hand over I've, to Ollie. I've, I've enjoyed this very much. So thank you for the invitation. No, it's thank been great. It's been great. I think and Andrew will probably want to come back in as well. Um, but I think yes, it, it, it's a really important topic to cover. I'm glad we've had the opportunity to do it and certainly glad that we've had the opportunity to get through so many people's questions as well, um, which has been great. I'll, I'm conscious of time. I just want to do the housekeeping so that everybody knows what's going to go happen just following on from the session. There is a survey that you'll be directed to automatically. We'd really value your feedback if you can take 30 seconds just to fill that out because it helps us to run better smoother events in the future and gives you the opportunity to give us any suggestions as well so please do take 30 seconds to complete that and um, as i said earlier we'll send you a certificate out by email tomorrow along with a link to the recording so you can check back on any of this and um, barry's email is still up on the screen and he's very very kindly offered uh, to field any questions by email um, andrew any comments no, just uh, as always, uh, thanks very much, um, Barry. That was a, a brilliant presentation. I think there's something for everyone in their sort of professional or personal life to, to take away. And it certainly um, demystified uh, a few uh, things um, that I'd had in, in my mind. So, yeah, thanks very much for that. And thank you, everyone, for um, being so engaged and for all the, all the great questions, as always. As we said at the beginning, We'll um, we'll keep you posted about the event on the twentieth of September, but please do um, keep an eye out for for that. But um, yeah, just to say uh, thanks again, uh, Barry, and um, yeah, watch out uh, for for the uh, post event information for, from Barry, and uh, please do get in touch um, if there's anything else we, we can help with. Brilliant, thanks very much, guys. I think when I when I end the session, it's going to kick all of our participants and us out quite abruptly. And um, so I will say thanks once again and see you soon.